Jocelyn, I'm going to share some slides because that keeps me on track. So let's see. Uh, here we go. Hold on. This one. So I feel at something of a disadvantage because, um, do you see my face in the top right corner there? Just give me a thumbs up. <laughs> um, I feel at something of a disadvantage because when I was looking through the agenda, you guys um, were really, what a phenomenal lineup you put together. And it was just so impressive. All the people saying all sorts of things that I would like to have said and that I can't hear that you did say. So I decided that I actually was going to do um, a mini passionate rant to close the day with. So let me just uh, start with that. So if we think about uh, what we do know, we have cities in the US that look like this and actually cities around the world that have this. We have other cities that have shaped themselves like this. And um, we have other cities where there's still incredible chaos, chaos and density reigning. Um, what this brings to me is that transportation is still the most significant contributor to CO2 emissions. So I realize this is a messy chart. That top line is um, the power plants themselves. And so here is how we are consuming that. And you can see disappointingly that transport over the last 35 years, 25 years, is pretty much flat. We did a tiny bit better and is on the uptick. And um, those of you who are in this room, we are the ones who can help make this change. We are the ones who can address this. And so I just want to go down to my the rant that I cannot leave without doing. Um, infrastructure is our destiny. What we, we reap, what we sow. And if there ever was an infrastructure that is our destiny, it is this planetary infrastructure. And I admit I haven't been there today. And I, I think even when I'm speaking to people who work in climate day in, day out, we need this reminder that I'm going to do. So here is a chart that is globally, is this year hotter or colder than the 20th century average? And you can see if you have been born after 1980, you have never experienced a cooler than average year from a planetary perspective. If you look at the last five years, they've been the five hottest years. And we all remember, I think August was the hot, hottest month um, in recorded in the last 130 years of months. And what is really concerning is that scientists, we already warmed by about one degree centigrade. And scientists are telling us that we're gonna have plus five or six degrees centigrade by 2100 under business as usual, despite the genius of the Paris Agreement where everyone worked hard and we made promises to reduce by three and a half degrees, which is not what we need to do. Uh, we know that we're still operating under this business as usual look. And as I've been thinking about that, this five or six degrees centigrade, I can't relate to it. And so I've been so I went to do some research. How can I make that number meaningful in my mind, visceral for me? So I went and looked at the last time we are minus four and a half degrees cooler, where you are sitting today, and all across North America, America and Europe was four and a half degrees cooler and under several kilometers of ice. And this is um this is pictures of city skylines under kilometers of ice. Montreal was under three and a half kilometers of ice, where I usually am residing in Boston was under, my bed in Boston was under a kilometer and a half of ice. So just imagine in your mind, what does it look like to warm a planet by four and a half degrees? It's you and Europe sitting under kilometers of ice to today, and that took 20,000 years. And we're going forward that amount in the next 85. So the existentialness of our situation is incredibly clear to me. And the IPCC came out with this nice report in 2018, where they said the point of the report was, what is the difference between one and a half and two degrees um, warming? And that we really want to go to one and a half degrees. And this crazy chart here, we need to have reductions 50% by 2030. And if you look at the slope of both of those slopes, we all look at charts all of our, in our professional lives, both of those slopes seem improbable. And the slope of that's a more steep one that we need to get to if we want to hold to one and a half degrees is this 50% reduction by 2030. So while it's improbable, I just want to bring forward, these are the differences of a one and a half degree warming world and a two degree warming world. And I'm just going to point out a few to you. 
one and a half degrees, the Arctic will be ice-free once every 100 years. At two degrees, the Arctic has ice-free once every 10 years. Imagine, imagine that incredible difference and what that, the implications of that are for the rest of for us humans in the world as well as the rest of the environment. Just to call out two more, the difference between one and a half and two degrees is a doubling in the decline of fisheries. And think of all of the humanity and the fish economies, country economies that are dependent on the fisheries and think about what that means for climate immigration. The population exposed to severe heat is doubled between one and a half and two degrees. And again, thinking about suffering and immigration. So when we think that it is impossible to reduce emissions by 50% by, 50 by 2030, when you say those words or when you think that in your mind, you are saying, I'm okay with the two degree world. So I know you're not okay. And I know we all think it's improbable. And the, I normally am in the US and I want to say, look at the US and look at Brexit and see that we can break traditional paths. We can break cultural norms. We can break laws. We can do whatever is required to make this happen. We can move more quickly. And when we think it's too hard, uh, I suggest that we don't really like the alternative. Now to some good news. The entire transportation sector, in my view, is like tectonic plates that are all completely molten lava in motion. It is an amazing moment that we have today. The entire sector is up for grabs. And this is stressing existing business models, existing regulations, and existing revenue streams. And it is provoking in cities and national governments around the world a reevaluation of the status quo because it is breaking what we have built, our laws and built power power structures on and people on the streets also aren't, aren't happy. So I look at this and I think, way, yes, this is a moment. We need this kind of disruption exactly at this moment. And so let's seize this incredible disruption to transform where we are going. Let's take the conversations that are happening in cities around the world and the stresses and pressures and make good of it. And as I think about you guys in that room there, I can't see you. We need to all row together in the same direction. Um, I've, been, I've done a lot of um, private sector startups, and I just did my first nonprofit called NUMO.Global, New Urban Mobility Alliance, and I'm going to urge you all to join. Um, two years ago, I worked with 10 of the largest city and transport NGOs around the world to create these shared mobility principles. And the idea was if we can have the public sector and the private sector aligned on some values, then we can move more quickly and have less disagreement on how we're getting there. And um, in the last two years, we have a couple hundred companies and large NGOs that have signed on and said, indeed, we do agree with this set of as our future. And I'm going to urge you all to go join that so we can create um, regional hubs and work with governments and say, this is where we want to go. I'm just going to pull up a few of these here. And, and some of them are so obvious and some of them are very challenging. And I would say these are aspirational for every signer. No one is doing, no country, no entity, no private sector company is doing this perfectly, but this is our aspiration, our constitute, where we wanna go. And so, yes, we should be planning cities and mobility together. We should be moving people, not cars. Um, I just wanna come call out a few other ones. Oh, nope, this is where I'm going to be doing some ranting. Um, we need to make efficient use of space and assets, and we can know that all the micromobility, the road share, the ride sharing, the car sharing, all of these things are making efficient use of space and assets. And we need to do much more lane reallocation um, in cities around the world. And even in cities where we've done a good job, we know there is more to do. That in the past, we have made personal cars easy and cheap, the most convenient mode of transport. And we need to write that balance. If we want to have a multimodal world, which I think we do with a lot of options and choice, we need to write the balance from the car dominated into a multimodal one. And so that requires this reallocation of our city streets. And the other, of course, we need to transition towards zero emission vehicles. My other most, the principle that I love the most is number seven, fair user fees across all modes. Today in cities everywhere, we have this incredible iniquity of letting cars off the hook for paying for air pollution, congestion, how much it costs to park or store their car or touch the curbs. 
and in many, many countries around the world, even pay for basic infrastructure of the roads. That it is all of this is heavily subsidized. If we, I'm not asking that we penalize cars more than anything else. I'm asking us to make create a level playing field so that all of us, whether new innovations, have business models that make sense and that we can start writing this incredible iniquity between what happens on our streets and the business models that we can scrap out required that we have these fair user feeds across all modes. Just one example of uh, some an egregious one. In Portland, Oregon, um, for the electric scooters, they put a price of 25 cents per trip tax on those electric scooters. Since most scooters are traveling about one, two kilometers a trip on average, it would be the equivalent of a $5 per gallon tax on cars. And so on this thing that we're, that electric scooters that we are wanting to have more of because it's sustainable, zero emission, very space efficient, cheap. We are putting, cities around the world are putting taxes on these new forms of mobility because it's easier than touching the sacred cow of personal car ownership. Um, I can't see you. And I just want to leave with two things, and then I'm going to do something I haven't done before. Um, I want to say I'm actually incredibly optimistic about the future because all of you guys sitting there, and all of us working here, we have these new tools of the internet, of smartphones, of GPS, that are making sharing really simple. So we can now have shared cars, shared rides, shared transit data, shared scooters, shared bikes with much less drama and friction than there used to be. And so here, I think we do have these tools. And I want to say the status quo for most of us isn't great. And so this is just a beautiful example from Seoul, Korea. I'm a very famous uh, example in the transport sector. This was the Chungcheong Highway that in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they put a double decker on this route and, and uh, went over what used to be a river. And so it was 16 lanes of traffic. You can imagine the horror of living nearby, that it was a disgusting place. The mayor of Seoul decided that he wanted to create a signature project so he could become president of Korea, South Korea. And so he ripped off all of those lanes and tore it down and revealed the stream that was underneath. And I've been on this place. I've been here. There he, they created two, two lanes on each of the two sides that are sh for shared transport. And it is a delightful place, needless to say. And of course, the traffic evaporates and does other things and people travel other ways much more efficiently. And so I look at this and I want to say, infrastructure is destiny. We have to get this transition right. Where those tectonic plates cool must necessarily be on the path of sustainable and equitable transport. We don't have the time to screw this up and make the wrong choices. So here I'm going to do something I've never done. Let me just take myself off of screen sharing. Hold on. Let me see how I do that. Uh, stop share. I think you see my face big. So I'm going to do this um, remotely, which I have never done. So someone in someone there is going to have to be paying attention. Um, I want to ask you guys a question to leave you for your day. So I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you the question, and then we will do the poll. So my question to you is, do you think existing companies and existing governments will evolve quickly enough to address climate change and inequality, or will they move too slowly and that people will rise up and revolt? So my question before you is, do you think the next five to 10 years is one of evolution or one of revolution? So now I want this to be an anonymous poll. So everyone close your eyes and please someone in the audience tell me, someone on stage tell me, I want everyone's eyes closed. So, are your eyes closed? Everyone, over to the left, right, closed eyes. If you believe the future is one of I have evolution, to double check. No, not yet. Close your eyes. Everyone, please. I can see some eyes still open. Still open. Okay, let's vote. If you think the future is one of evolution, please raise your hands. Okay, hands down. Keep your eyes shut. If you think the future is one of revolution, please raise your hands. Everyone, keep those hands up, open your eyes, and look around. I'm not even in the room, and I can tell you that 80 to 90% of you voted revolution. Am I right? Yes. So here's what I want to tell you. I'm asking this question of audiences around the world. And whether I'm talking to CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, um, the staff in the White House, 
university students, venture capitalists, no matter what the country is, I'm getting that answer. And so I'm urging you, my, my personal life mission, why I'm spending time with you today and doing five talks in one week, is we need to speed the pace of evolution to avoid revolution. We are at a moment of extreme crisis. We need to move faster and farther in a gentler way. And I'm sure that you didn't realize that the person sitting next to you and 80% of the people around you realized the same thing as you. Those are your collaborators, collaborators in this moment. We need to be revolutionary evolutionists. We need to move faster and faster. And so speak out more loudly, take stronger stands, break the norms. And you have, I'm telling you, you have people who think exactly like you and who are quiet about it. So find those partners, find those collaborators, and let's move faster and forward. And to circle back where I started, transportation is the single largest sector to produce emissions, and it's making people's lives miserable. We can't get to jobs. We can't have fun times with our children. It's really expensive. It's filthy dirty. It's causing us to be fat and unhappy. We can solve this problem, that we have to do it together and collaboratively. So um, thank you, and have a great day to, time tonight and um, day tomorrow. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you.